Newton thought that light was made of streaming particles together forming rays. These rays could be analyzed through processes of reflection and refraction, but they were in the end still composed of particles. Some years later, and the first form of the double slit experiment was performed by Young, which demonstrated light to possess the properties of interference and diffraction, and therefore put it in the category of waves. These light waves were thought to propagate through a medium called the ether, similar to how sound waves propagate through air as pressure fluctuations. Later, however, the idea of the ether was discarded and the concept of light particles or photons was brought again to fruition with a discovery by Max Planck, which stated that light can only be absorbed and emitted in discrete quantities or quanta, defined in terms of what is now called Planck's constant or H. This constant represents the minimum amount of energy that can be transferred between any two systems. All this led physicists to question the validity of the double slit experiment and drove them to repeat it again. This time, a single photon was fired. It landed somewhere on the screen behind the slits. Then a second photon was fired. It landed on a different part of the screen. When this process was continued, physicists observed the familiar interference pattern emerging from the statistical distribution of photons on the screen. The puzzling thing here was that if the photons traveled as particles, they must have formed instead a sort of a projection of the two slits. The fact that they didn't meant that any individual photon must have traversed the two slits as a wave, interfered with itself and then collapsed to a single particle when the wave hit the screen. If the photon was measured instead at either one of the two slits, it immediately collapsed into a particle and the expected two slit pattern was produced. For this wave slash particle, one can define its momentum and its energy in terms of the Planck constant and the frequency or wavelength of the wave. Out of this then comes out mechanics which state that the uncertainty in measurement of the three coordinates of position times the uncertainty in measurement of the three coordinates of momentum can never be less than h over 4 pi. A similar relationship holds for the uncertainty in energy and time interval. The conclusion from this principle, called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is that you cannot predict with perfect accuracy the state of any physical system which has evolved from the present moment outwards toward the past and future. Similar to how light waves were shown to behave as particles, the newly discovered material particles at the time, such as the electron, were shown to behave as waves, and were therefore also subject to these new mechanics. Based on this discovery, Erwin Schrödinger formulated what is now called the Schrödinger equation, which expressed the evolution of the wave, represented by a wave function, psi, usually a function of position and time, in terms of an energy operator, namely the Hamiltonian. At any moment, one might take the square amplitude of the wave function to find the probability of a given particle being in a given place. Integrating over all these probabilities is equal to 1, as we are sure that a definite outcome will occur. The Schrödinger equation presented us with a continuous, deterministic and reversible evolution of the wave function, whereas the act of measurement or observation presented us with a spontaneous, probabilistic and irreversible collapse. The first mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics, namely Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, and the second formulation, Schrödinger's wave mechanics, were both synthesized by Paul Dirac under the so-called transformation theory, which was built on the basis of transformations or vectors in Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is the space in which the wave function lives in. Each point in it represents a possible state for the system. A lot of the groundwork for Hilbert spaces was put forward by John von Neumann in his book Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. With that, most of the modern mathematical formalism of QM was laid out. However, one could not overlook the fact that the physical interpretation of these complex equations was difficult to grasp. The standard, so-called Copenhagen interpretation, advocated by Niels Bohr, described a quantum system as a wave or cloud of probability, which, whenever measured by an observer, collapses to a particle in accordance with those probabilities. Many physicists were unsatisfied by this explanation because of the lack of definition for such words as observer or measurement, including Einstein, who thought that the randomness that's intrinsic to the collapse must be the result of hidden variables. Other physicists have proposed an interpretation where the collapse is due to some physical process, such as Penrose's gravitational collapse, where the effect of gravity is what causes the transition to a definite state. Others think we should look from the side, and consider the observer as a physical system described by a wave function psi, which, when observing, or simply interacting, entangles with the wave function of the observed system, which basically produces a new composite wave function. This process can be repeated until we arrive at the universal wave function, a superposition of all the possible universes. Here I want to speak of a different interpretation, and one which is a modification, as many are, of the Copenhagen interpretation. 
Consider again the process of observation as interaction between two physical systems. At the point of interaction, values of variables are defined, and they are always defined relative to some system. This system we might call the observing system. In this sense, any physical system can be an observer, and no special privilege is given to a particular human consciousness. Going back to the example of an entangled system of observer and observed, a second observer might interact and collapse it, for example by making the first observer report on his findings. The state of the initially observed quantum system must be in correspondence with the system as observed by the second observer. Continuing this process, we soon discover that what is being propagated here is a physical quantity, quite unlike energy or mass. The quantity that we are speaking of here is information. The first person to give a quantitative account of information was Claude Shannon. In describing the process of communication between a transmitter and a receiver, Shannon told us to imagine a message that travels through a medium called the channel. Any channel can be ascribed a number representing all possible messages that can be sent. The more the possible messages, the more information one would gain when one receives a single message. If there is only a single possible message, then receiving it would give no additional information, as no uncertainty would be resolved. Therefore, the minimum amount of information that can be received is that from a message of at least two possible messages, or one bit of information. One can express the amount of information in bits for any message by taking the base 2 logarithm of the number of possible messages. If different messages have different probabilities of occurring, then the information is higher than if not, and the equation is adjusted for this increase. Through the study of thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, scientists have found a way to implement the concept of information in physics. When you have a complex system of many variables, instead of speaking of it as being in a certain state, you can speak of it as being in a range of possible states with differing probabilities. Then you can calculate the entropy of this probability distribution, which turns out to be precisely the amount of information one would gain if one observed the system completely. The second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases, or that we are constantly losing information. This entire description, however, was thought to be due to our ignorance, due to our lack of knowledge of all the variables. In quantum mechanics this is not the case. The probabilistic description is an intrinsic aspect of reality. There, the loss of information is due to the entanglement of the observed system and its environment, whereas the entanglement of the observer with the system results in an increase in information. Some ideas here are still relatively new, but one can trace these approaches to the interpretation of quantum mechanics, most notably back to John Archibald Wheeler. A renowned physicist who worked with Einstein, Bohr, Feynman and many others and who coined the term black hole and came up with the concept of a wormhole. He thought at first that everything is made of particles, then fields, and then arrived at the startling realization that at the bottom, reality is defined in terms of the distinction between the probe and the probed. This was a participatory universe. If no question was asked, no answer was given. Or in the words of Wheeler, the quantum, H, in whatever correct physics formula it appears, serves as a lamp. It lets us see horizon area as information lost, understand wave number of light as photon momentum, and think of field flux as bit registered fringe shift, giving us its as bits. The quantum presents us with physics as information. The conclusion from this entire discussion is that physics in general, and quantum theory in particular, might not be about physical reality itself, but about our knowledge of this reality. Knowledge which can be expressed, the apparatus elicited answers to yes or no questions. A photon can either be detected or not. Everything else comes out as the statistics of these bit registrations. A theory to predict what you can predict between measurements.